You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Let's try to understand what was happening to immigrants, unions, and the federal government after World War II. Now, <clears throat> the United States under the Truman and Eisenhower administrations sought to unite labor with capital through the, through the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act. This was a, a wave of strikes occurred in 1946 after World War II ended and wartime wage price controls began to erode. Now, the strike wave of the mid-1940s is going to set the stage for passage of what will be known as the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which included injunctions for national emergency disputes. And the Labor Management Relations Act of 1947, better known as Taft-Hartley, was the first in a series of legislative moves to get labor to cooperate with what will then become known as the Cold War and the solidification of the military-industrial educational complex. And the bill allowed the president to order employees back to work in the event of a strike. The act permitted states to adopt right-to-work laws and ban the closed shop. Now, the closed shop has been a very pow powerful tool for unions. Closed shops were closed to those who did not belong to a corresponding union. So if everyone had to be a member of the union, it would make the union stronger as it would have the support of all members, of all employees. By eliminating union membership as a prerequisite for many jobs, unions lost a great deal of their power and the ability to organize. Now that union membership was no longer required for employment, Union members recognized that they would be replaced if they went on strike. And this is where the Taft-Hartley bill is, becomes important because, again, the significance of immigration policy, especially with regards to the Mexican situation and organizing Mexicans in the fields. Now, ordinarily, unions might have been able to use alternative methods to say, sway their employer's opinion, but the Taft-Hartley Act banned these as well. Both sympathy strikes and secondary boycotts were banned. Now, most importantly, union officials were required to swear that they were not communists, reflecting a new red scare that was sweeping the nation. And those who refused to make such statements were left without legal protection, and the nation's largest unions that I talked to you about during the Great Depression experiences, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, the organization that brought us the weekend, expelled numerous left-wing officials and 11 communist-led unions, representing almost one million workers. In the public mind, unions became associated with communism. Of course, today, terrorism has conveniently replaced communism. So let's go to a film clip that addresses Labor's reaction to the Taft-Hartley Act. Let's listen to Labor leader Walter Ruther. The Taft-Hartley Act will fail to achieve industrial stability because it is a negative approach to problems that require positive solutions. In a free society, labor capital peace is possible only if workers can achieve economic security and social justice for themselves and their families. The Taft-Hartley Act will fail to achieve industrial stability because it is a negative approach to problems that require positive solution. In a society of free men, labor capital peace is possible only if the working people can achieve economic security and social justice for themselves and their families. If Congress wants to make a contribution towards industrial peace in America, it must begin to deal with the people's problems. It must roll back the cost of living, give our veterans and their families decent homes, give our children educational opportunities, and provide the old people of this country with security in their old age. We spent billions and billions to win the war, and we've got to be as courageous in spending billions to make life better.
During the war, Congress appropriated $400 billion for battleships, bombers, to blow up homes and destroy life. We call upon Congress to show the same vision and the same courage to appropriate money to make life better, to give our children decent homes, to give them a good educational opportunity, medical care, to give our old, old people security in their old age. But when we call upon Congress to appropriate money to help people, they don't give us billions as they did in war, but they get out the congressional eyedropper and give us a couple of drops. And we believe that a country that has the power and the strength to spend billions to destroy life ought to have the courage and the strength to do the same thing to make life better. During the war, the Congress appropriated $400 billion for battleships and bombers to destroy homes and to destroy life. And we're asking Congress to show the same wisdom and the same courage to appropriate money to make life better in America, to give us the things that we can produce so that we can have a higher standard of living. But when we call upon the Congress to appropriate money to help people, they don't appropriate billions and billions. They get out the congressional eyedropper and give us a couple of drops. We believe that a country that can spend $400 billion to destroy life can afford to spend the same amount of money to make life better. Walter Ruthermount, <clears throat> I mean, he was the man who was responsible for the organizing of the sit-down strikes in the CIO, and here he is making a statement with regards to the United States and its largesse, especially with regards to going to war, then why not invest in people? Now, in 1950, an act was passed known as the Internal Security Act, and that became a federal law, and it was passed during what was known as the McCarthy era. It was passed over President Harry Truman's veto. But the anti-communist fervor was a bipartisan fervor, and it only uh, 10 Democrats, uh, Democratic senators voted to uphold the veto. It required communist organizations to register with the United States Attorney General and establish the Subversive Activities Control Board to investigate persons suspected of engaging in subversive activities or otherwise promoting the establishment of a quote-unquote totalitarian dictatorship, fascist, or communist. Members of these groups could not become citizens and in some cases were prevented from entering or leaving the country. Citizens found in violation could lose their citizenship in five years. The act also contained an emergency detention statute giving the president the authority to apprehend and detain each person as to whom there is a reasonable ground to believe that such person probably will engage in or probably will conspire with others to engage in acts of espionage or sabotage. Now, a key institution in the era of the Cold War, it tightened alien exclusion and deportation laws and allowed for the detention of dangerous, disloyal, and subversive persons in times of war or internal security emergency. The Democratic-controlled Congress overrode President Harry S. Truman's veto to pass it, and President Truman called it the greatest danger to freedom of speech, press, and assembly since the Alien and Sedition Laws of 1798. He also said it was a mockery of the Bill of Rights and that it was a long step towards totalitarianism. Well, that was the 1950 Internal Security Act. But after World War II, what Harry Truman is going to be dealing with, as well as uh, the uh, uh, Eisenhower administration, um, world foreign affairs played an increasingly significant role in the lives of American citizens. The United States and its allies competed in, with the United Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR, and its allies for political and economic dominance around the world. It was known as the Cold War, and this rivalry between the U.S. and the Soviet Union shaped almost every aspect of international politics, as well as many domestic concerns, until the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the dissolution of the USSR in the early 1990s, where communism no longer was the threat. And so the United States created a new threat, and that is known as Islam. But when post-war Europe divided into communist and capitalist camps, 
and then China's Communist Revolution succeeded in 1949, public opinion generally shifted to support the protection of democracy and capitalism against communist expansion. And that tension came to a head in Korea. In 1950, North Korean communist troops invaded South Korea, which was an American ally. In this, the United States found that they could extend the Bracero program because now they needed Braceros constantly for the war effort. Now, seeking to protect South Korea and to prevent the spread of communism in Asia, President Harry Truman sent General Douglas MacArthur to command the United Nations forces. Lasting three years, the Korean conflict was dominated by politically motivated negotiations and stalemates that delayed the armistice and cost thousands of lives. So when hostilities ceased, Chinese armies remained on their side of the North Korean border and the North and the South separated, was separated by a wide demilitarized zone. Uh, this demilitarized zone entered a lengthy period of tense relations that we still have to this day. Communist expansion in Eastern Europe and Korea fueled Americans' anxiety that their way of life was under attack and it launched the career of Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy. McCarthy made headlines when he announced in a 1950 speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, that he knew 205 communists were currently working in the State Department. And capitalizing on people's fear of encroaching communism, McCarthy launched a public campaign aimed at eliminating the supposed communist, communist influent, infiltration of government and foreign policy. So his pronouncements catapulted him to national prominence, and he became the chair of the Senate Permanent Investigations Subcommittee. McCarthy took it upon himself to expose communists and their sympathizers, not only in government, but also throughout American political and cultural life. So McCarthy's accusations were often unsubstantiated, but in, in a political and cultural climate filled with fear that gave him considerable power. And hiding behind the veil of national security, McCarthy and his staff refused to reveal their sources of information at a time when simply being called uh, before his committee could ruin an individual's career. So fearful of being named communist sympathizers themselves, many leaders of labor unions and professional organizations joined in the Red Scare hysteria of the early 1950s. And it is within this hysteria that, again, labor unions reacted. And some intellectuals and advocates refused to answer their, his questions or appear before his committee despite the threat to their personal well-being and the threat of deportation. Several famous Hollywood producers and script writers were among the best-known citizens blacklisted by their employers for refusing to cooperate with the committee. So McCarthy's accusation in 1953 that the military was harboring communists ultimately led to his downfall. In fact, it was Edward Morrow who successfully exposed his tactics and publicly denounced his actions as a threat to America's core democratic values. We will visit Edward Morrow. He will become a very important personage in the flight, plight of, um, of undocumented and farm labor groups. Now, the fear of communism significantly affected American domestic policy regarding both immigration policy and workers' rights. Now, in the 1920s, the United States experienced its first Red Scare soon after Russia's Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 that had brought communism to the forefront of people's minds. Well, in the 1950s, the U.S. experience is going to experience a similar wave of anti-communist fear during the first phases of the Cold War. Overall, this anti-communist fear led to both social and economic policies, and it impacted immigration policy. Now, the first Red Scare was a political and social response to real and imagined fears about leftist and anarchist forces in the United States after the Russian Revolution. J. Edgar Hoover was put in charge of a new branch of the Bureau of Investigation to specifically investigate radical groups. So the first Red Scare, as we, we uh, understood in this class for the white beans, targeted leftists in general and included non-radical and nonviolent socialists. Now, though socialism was a major force in American politics, its similarities to communism led many to fear socialist activity after 1917. Workers' strikes were now interpreted as attempts to lead the U.S. to communism, and socialist leaders, such as former presidential candidate Eugene Debs, was jailed under the Espionage Act. And in Debs' case for a speech that called for resistance to World War I draft, 
Now, the most significant reaction to the Red Scare, however, was immigration policy. It was fear that the influx of these radicals and anarchists, um, that the U.S. is going to pass the immigration restriction legislation of the 1920s, especially the Immigration Quota Act of 1924. So when we take a look at uh, the 1950s, uh, there's going to be, the U.S. is going to experience the second Red Scare during the Cold War after Senator Joseph McCarthy began using anti-communist rhetoric to accuse his political opponents of treason. So J. Edgar Hoover now is still director of the FBI. He's going to use his bureau to help investigate communist threats. And ultimately, many people are going to lose their jobs after being wrongfully accused of communism. And many, including a considerable number of Hollywood actors and writers, are going to be put on blacklists. So while McCarthyism declined after a public and judicial backlash in the late 1950s, anti-communist fears remained prevalent across the U.S. McCarthyism, uh, uh, again, uh, let me just share with you, McCarthyism is the practice of making accusations of disloyalty, subversion, or treason without proper regard for evidence. Again, McCarthyism is the practice of making accusations of dis disloyalty, subversion, or treason without proper regard for evidence. So since 9-11, we are amid a resurgent McCarthyism. Now, amid this uh, Cold War hysteria, Congress passed uh, uh, very controversial bills regarding immigration restriction in the United States. We've already covered uh, the first bill, which was the in 1950 Internal Security Act, but then there's two other bills that were attached to this act, and that was the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 and the Subversive Activities Control Act of 1952. Now, the Immigration and Nation Nationality Act of 1952 um, um, was sponsored by Senator Pat McCarran. It's usually called the McCarran Act, and it required communist organizations and people suspected of communist organization affiliations to register with the U.S. Attorney General. Now, this legislature unfairly targeted Asians and created largely symbolic opportunities. Any immigrant identifies as a communist could never achieve citizenship and could be detained without any burden of proof. Now, the United States had quotas of how many people would be allowed in the country, especially those from communist regimes. So the government was afraid that they would spread communist subversive thought and destabilize the country. So the multiple laws which governed immigration and naturalization at that time are going to be brought under one comprehensive uh, uh, <clears throat> quota system. So it's going to, the, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, along with Subversive Con Activities Control Act of 1952, are going to reaffirm the 1924 National Origins Quota System. It limited immigration from Eastern Europe while uh, it allowed Western Europeans to come in. Again, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants are allowed entry into the United States. Now, the Subversive uh, uh, Activities Control Act, along with the Immigration and Nationality Act, reflected the Cold War atmosphere and anti-communism of the period following World War II and at the onset of the Korean War. The law reinforced the Smith Act of 1940 and coupled with the Immigration and Nationality Act, enforced the continuation of the national origins quota system. So President Truman, who uh, vetoed uh, the acts, um, was uh, outdone. And in his words, he, he uh, told Congress that today we are protecting ourselves as we were in 1924 against being flooded by immigrants from Eastern Europe. This is fantastic. We do not need to be protected against immigrants from these countries. On the contrary, we want to stretch out a helping hand to save those who have managed to flee into Western Europe, to succor those who are brave enough to escape from barbarism, to welcome and restore them against the day when their countries will, as we hope, to be free again. There are only a few examples of this absurdity. The cruelty of carrying over into this year of 1952 the isolationist limitations of our 1924 law. In no other realm of our national life are we so hampered and stultified by the dead hand of the past as we are in this field of immigration. So Truman was talking about, again, uh, the white beans. Right? But at least he was addressing the white beans who were fleeing the Soviet Union and its, and its influence. Let's go to a news report by Mike Wallace that helps us appreciate McCarthyism.
In the late 1940s and the 50s, an epidemic of fear swept across America, a fear of communist aggression abroad, coupled with the divisive fear of communist subversion at home. As a result, many decent American citizens found their patriotism challenged by unknown accusers, their reputations ruined, their careers destroyed, all in the name of national security. For many Americans, the world seemed to be spinning out of control. America seems to be the most powerful, the most moral nation on earth, and yet it is losing everywhere to the communists. Eastern Europe is going communist. China just goes to the communists. How do you explain this? It was true that China had fallen to the communists. It was also true that professional Soviet spies, with the help of a few American traitors, had successfully stolen America's greatest secret. The Soviet Union now had the atomic bomb and a nuclear World War III suddenly had become a real possibility. Duck and cover. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready for it. That's why these children are practicing to duck and cover just as you do in your school. Americans built bomb shelters and stockpiled food. And just as in World War II, they kept sharp lookout for homegrown spies and saboteurs. They really feared communism. After all, we were engaged in a Cold War with the Soviet Union. Communism was the greatest menace to our lives, to our welfare, to our security. Communism was so frightening to many Americans that they were willing to stand by and do nothing as traditional American principles of justice were overturned, all in the name of national security. So-called Red Scares before the war. There was, there was one after World War I. Uh, but this time, the, the communist menace was supported by this huge military power, the Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, we gave the Soviets far more credit than they deserved as far as their weaponry and their reach was concerned. But it, it, it gave us a kind of a Satan figure. And uh, his physical appearance counts for nothing. If he openly declares himself to be a communist, we take his word for it. If a person consistently reads and advocates... Since most Americans had no idea what a communist was, government propaganda films provided helpful hints. More difficult to detect are the undercover workers of communism. They can be discovered only through sharp vigilance over a long period of time. Anti-communist paranoia swept the country in 1946 when news broke that Igor Guzenko, a cipher clerk at the Soviet embassy in Ottawa, had identified real Russian spies operating throughout North America. Arrests and deportations followed. Ethel Rosenberg, convicted of selling atomic secrets to the Soviet Union, became the first woman in US peacetime history to be executed for espionage. Yes, there was a certain amount of fear there. Uh, I never felt it, the people I lived with, never felt it. Nobody where I grew up was looking over his or her shoulder to see if the Red Menace was crawling up through Ebbets Field or something. It wasn't. Uh, but there were people who felt it, and I think media particularly. It was the last days before television took over. Uh, the media in particular, uh, the Hearst chains and a lot of the sort of right-wing conservative chains of newspapers uh, helped feed the fear. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition... People come to accept the idea that subversives like shouldn't have the same rights like as everybody else. A quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. The going from the climate of fear sweeping the nation. When Joseph Persico was writing a biography of Edward R. Murrow many years later, he asked the FBI to send whatever it had on Murrow in its files. I got back a thousand pages. You would have thought that I had asked for the file on Vladimir Lenin, not an outstanding, upstanding American. The seven inch thick, 1,354 page FBI file on Edward R. Murrow is just one of tens of thousands that the Federal Bureau of Investigation accumulated on American citizens. Files bulging with unsupported allegations of disloyalty and reckless charges of subversion. Such files were proof that Americans had become frightened not just of Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong, but of one another. And some politicians were quick to exploit that fear for their own narrow political purposes.
the Republican Party, and particularly the isolationist wing in the center of the country, had been out of power and had lost five elections in a row. And they understand that Roosevelt has so changed the demographics of the country with the New Deal and those reforms that they cannot campaign on economic issues. So they have to seize on the issue of subversion, implying that the Democrats have been in cahoots with the communists. The actual number of Americans who were hardcore, card-carrying, dues-paying members of the Communist Party was never more than one-tenth of one percent of the population of the United States, even during the depth of the Depression. And it's likely the FBI knew just who all of them were. The real Soviet agents and spies, the ones who managed to steal the secrets of the atomic bomb, for example, wouldn't be caught dead at a Communist Party meeting. But the party members, and those who had only flirted with the Communist Party in their youth, they made easy targets for politicians looking for someone to blame for the reversal of America's fortunes in the post-war world. We must have order in these chambers. In 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee went to Hollywood to investigate allegations of communist subversion of the American movie industry. And it was quite a show. The first HUAC witnesses were famous and friendly and eager to please. I have never read uh, Karl Marx and I don't know the basis of communism beyond what I've uh, picked up from hearsay. What I've heard, I don't like it. I would move to the state of Texas if it ever came here because I think the Texans would kill them on sight. <laughs> then came the unfriendly witness. We're going to get the answer to that question if we have to stay here for a week. And the fireworks that made the hearings front page news. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm framing my answer in the only way in which any American citizen can frame his then you deny, the question then you, which invades his, absolutely invades Then his you right. deny to... In the end, seven screenwriters, two directors, and one producer refused to answer the committee's questions. And they became what was known as the Hollywood Ten. All of them went to jail for contempt of Congress including two-time Oscar-winning screenwriter Ring Lardner, Jr., and Hollywood movie director Edward Dimitrik. We thought that we had a right to believe what we wanted to believe. And even though I wasn't a communist, I thought everybody, there was no law against communism in this country. And I believed that everybody, in other words, it was a matter, it was a matter of principle. And we had come to the conclusion that the only way to handle this was not to answer the questions. I can belong to any party that I see fit to join, and you have no right to fight. So, you fight a battle, you lose it, you know, you suffer. You don't cry. You take your, you take your beating. Isn't that what you do? Isn't that the old American spirit? Those who resisted the congressman were the exception rather than the rule. Most of Hollywood seemed willing to cooperate. As a result, more than 300 writers, directors, and actors, all suspected of being communists or of knowing communists, or of having communist sympathies were put out of work, blacklisted by the movie industry with no chance to refute the allegations. Hollywood was closed down as far as we were concerned. My wife was also blacklisted in, 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 in the business simply because she was my wife, not because she was a communist, because she certainly never was. There were no heroes and no villains, only victims on both sides. All right, now it is within this framework that Edward R. Morrow, an American broadcast journalist, is going to be noted for his honesty and his integrity in delivering the news.